Good morning, I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and I want to invite you to this special summer worship celebration. Ready Vacation Bible School friends? One, two, three. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. Yay! Our first lesson this morning comes from the book of Psalm. 139, verses 1 through 6, and verses 13 through 18. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end. I am still with you. The word of the Lord. We are continuing on in the Gospel of Luke. We are in Luke chapter 14. We are in verses 15 through 24. As Debbie alluded to, this is uh, the grand banquet. Listen for the word of the Lord. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat the bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, <clears throat> Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I have to go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I've just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has already been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So part of this passage is about excuses excuses. So I'm going to give you some classic examples. And if you're a teacher, you can let me know if any of these uh, have come through your desk. <clears throat> a list that public schools have received from parents of students through the years. Teacher, please excuse Mary from being absent. She was sick and I had her shot. I hope that means they got a shot at the doctor, but I, uh, my son is under a doctor's care and should not take PE today. Please execute him. <laughs> Please excuse my son's tardiness. I forgot to wake him up and did not find him until I started making the beds. <laughs> Please excuse Jennifer for missing school yesterday. We forgot to get the Sunday paper off the porch, and when we found it Monday, we thought it was Sunday. 
Thank you. <laughs> and now moving to the college level, for you college students listening and out there, get a pen, get ready. Douglas Bernstein, a psychology professor at the University of Illinois, recently asked his faculty members for the most unusual, bizarre, and amazing student excuses. He got dozens. I'm just going to give you a couple. Grandparent death was an old favorite, but one professor's class established some sort of record when 14 out of 250 students reported their grandmother's death just before final exams. In another case, a student reported that he could not take the midterm because his grandmother had died. When the instructor expressed condolences a week later, the student replied, oh, don't worry, she was terminal, but she's feeling much better now. <laughs> car problems. I had an accident, the police impounded my car, and my paper is in the glove compartment. Animal trauma. I can't be at the exam today because my cat is having kittens and I'm her coach. <laughs> Crime victimization. I need to take the final early because the husband of the woman I'm seeing is threatening to kill me. <laughs> Actual excuses. Don't need any of that. We have enough of our own. In today's story, Jesus is getting ready to have a meal with the Pharisees. And we've already had some conversation about them coming in and the powerful people sitting at the head of the table and who sits at the back and Jesus saying, you shouldn't sit at a place of power. You should sit at the bottom. That way they can move you up if necessary. If somebody more important than you comes in, then you're going to have to ask to be booted down toward the end. And that's embarrassing for everybody. And then one of the Pharisees says, it's going to be great in the kingdom of heaven when we're all having bread together. And immediately Jesus tells this parable. He tells this story. He says, a man is throwing a banquet, a dinner. Very excited, ready to go. In the Middle Eastern culture, they usually invite twice the same people. The first, they send out a kind of a save the date, and they don't tell you when exactly that's going to be until closer to the time or what the hour will be. But if it's a dinner, you know that it'll be around sunset. So there's an initial and then a second invitation. So here, the slaves go out in two waves. He says, first, go out and get everybody because it's not going to be full and get the poor, the blind, the crippled, and the lame. Servant says, I've already done that and there's still room. He says, well, go out again. Go to every highway, into the bushes, which kind of means cities and into rural areas. Get anybody you can find, bring them to the table. Why aren't they coming? Well, Jesus gives us three examples of three excuses that are given. The first one, the man says, well, I've just purchased some property and I need to go investigate it. So we know it's a little bogus because who purchases a property that they've not already investigated. Anybody buy sight unseen some house or land or property of some sort? Probably not. Second, man says, well, I've, I've just purchased five head of oxen and I need to go investigate them. Okay. In the day, it was usually one oxen to one farmer would do kind of a normal family household. And the fact that there were five tells us that this is a wealthy person who had a bigger farming operation. But again, you're not going to buy oxen without having seen them first or ex in investigated them already. Anybody buy a car without seeing it or test driving it? Probably not. Most of us not. So this could be materialism. He wanted to go play with his cool new stuff which we often find ourselves in. There's always a fun new thing to keep us from maybe other things we should be involved in. And it could be work also, that he had to get to work no matter what time it was, and that was taking over his being able to come to this party, to this banquet. So the third one just simply says, I'm newly married. 
That's it. That's all we know. Doesn't say my wife wants me at home. Doesn't say I got to go clean up. Doesn't say we got to get there. We're still unpacking and getting ready. Just says, I'm married. That's pretty much it. Which doesn't, again, make a whole lot of sense. There were some laws in Deuteronomy that if you were a soldier and you got married, um, you could have some time, but this was not a soldier. He was not going off to war. So Jesus gives us three clear examples of kind of bogus excuses. And we all know we make excuses. We all know that excuses tell us what we really think is important. What are we making excuses for? What would we rather be doing that we say we can't do something because we want to do something else? And that's not always bad things. Of course, you have to make decisions and make priorities in your life. But specifically when it comes to faith, we do a great job at making excuses, as these three men did when they were invited to the table. So then the very last thing, after we have the sense that all that were not originally invited were brought to the table, come in, Jesus then says a harsher word and says, even those who were invited will now not be able to come to the table. Why? Because their seat was taken by those who were not initially invited. Hmm. Okay. So where are we in this? Well, Pretty clearly, Jesus, God is our host. There is a banquet table set for us. Kind of our traditional understanding is that this is our salvation, this is afterlife, that we are all being invited through Christ to the table to claim our seat. As a matter of fact, when we have memorial services, often we use that language. The deceased has claimed their seat at the banquet table the place we hope to be. And yes, uh, that piece of it is solid and foundational, but the piece we miss is the piece that I believe is that there's a banquet table for us that's here and now in our earthly life as well. I think that banquet starts in this life and we are invited and then leads us to that ultimate banquet table when Christ welcomes us home. So the first thing is to recognize that we have been invited, that we have been invited. So that when we claim that invitation, we are then responsible to go out and bring others. When we say, who are we in the story? We are both those who have been invited and the slaves. Because we have a seat right now at the table that Christ has made for us. And once we claim that, just like the slaves, we're then meant to go out into the world and invite everybody that we can to this table. This is our calling. Well, who do we ask? Who are the right people we want sitting next to us at our table? Well, it's not our table, and it's not up to us who comes and who doesn't. That is God's decision, thank goodness, not mine or yours, but our job is to invite in the ways that God is leading us to. There's a somewhat humorous story told by Philip Yancey, who's an author, about a a couple that were getting married in Boston, and they went to the Hyatt in downtown Boston, and they had arranged everything, and close to the wedding, the groom got cold feet, backed out. Now, they had already put non-negotiable, not just a deposit, they had paid their $15,000 for their reception. And so the bride said, you know what? We're going to have a party anyway. She changed the menu to boneless chicken because the groom chickened out. She had spent some time 10 years ago in some homeless shelters herself. And so she sent out word to missions and homeless shelters through the downtown area and invited them to come to the Hyatt for the reception. And they came. And so there they were, addicts, street people, those who were used to eating whatever they can scrounge up, eating chicken cordon bleu, 
bleh, drinking champagne, dancing to the live band. They all came to the party that she extended to them. That too should be God's table. It's not us to make the determination on who's worthy or not because none of us is worthy. But thankfully, through Christ, we can accept our invitation and extend it to others as well. One of the things I like about the story is that it likens salvation to a party. When you look at feast and eat and meals, it's close to 180 times throughout the Bible. God is literally throwing us a party in this life and into the next. Sometimes we forget that we are supposed to laugh, that we are supposed to celebrate, instead get stuck in our church rut, and we just kind of exist. I'll tell you a little story uh, about Vicki and I. Uh, years ago when we lived in Raleigh, uh, Ellie, our oldest, her preschool was having a Christmas party. And we didn't know them very well. The teachers were all there. The families were all there looking to make some friends. And Vicki had called and I'd called her. What, what are we supposed to, is this formal? Is it informal? What are we wearing? I, I don't know. I don't think it's formal. And so we're both trying to figure out during our day what, what that's going to look like. And I had a brilliant idea, as I often do. And I called her and said, I got you covered. You don't worry about a thing. So when she got home, I had purchased for both of us full elf costumes. This was not a costume party. Had the ears, had the hat, had the cool striped shirt, had the pants and the little shoes with the points and the bell on the end. She said, what, what do you expect me to do here? <laughs> I said, we need to go and we need to have fun. I know it's not a costume party, but it's Christmas, so let's just do it. Somehow, some reason, she agreed. And so we come into this house filled with people who are dressed nicely, casually, nice Christmas sweaters, giving us the look. You knew this wasn't a costume party. Yeah, we do. We're just elves having fun. Merry Christmas. And they said, and what exactly do y'all do? Well, my wife's a Christian educator. I'm, I'm Presbyterian minister. You, you, you what now? <laughs> I'm pastor of a church. And the responses were really fascinating. From disdain from how, how, how dare you have fun as a minister? Why, why are you laughing and playing playfully? To some who said, if you were in our church, I would go to that church. Wherever your church is, I want to go. Which tells me that their view of church is that we don't celebrate and we can't laugh. Now, you don't want to go too far the other way and be disrespectful or irreverent, but God's design for us is to celebrate. That's what this banquet is all about. Your life is an invitation to this banquet for which we celebrate. We are not people of fear. We are not following Christ because we are hell scared. That's a great and awful term, isn't it? Hell scared which means really, when you think about it, we're just following because we're afraid that God's going to smack us down at any moment or we're going to rot in hell forever. Yay, Jesus loves me. It's just the opposite. We are a people of gratitude and of grace. Your first invitation was issued to you from the cross and the resurrection, that banquet table. The second one comes at the end of this lifetime. But right now, that table is available to you to live as a person of grace, not out of fear. God is not some, a, a God that has a clenched fist waiting to take us down should we misstep. Nor is Christianity a bunch of boxes that says, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. 
where we get caught sometimes is between believing in Christ and following Christ. As Presbyterians, we are good thinkers. We put a lot in our education, in our training. We talk about belief every week. We'll say the Apostles' Creed. That all starts with, I believe this and I believe that. And that's great. Often that's where we can start. But if we just believe but we do not follow, we are living half of our call. The follow can often be a harder thing to do because that's active. That means you're doing for Christ. It means you are living those beliefs. Sometimes you start with actions that lead to belief. It can come both ways. But our challenge is not just to say we believe, but to follow actively this invitation that's been placed in front of us. And again, it's not just our invitation that we are welcoming and accepting, because then we're called to go out and bring others in, because there are so many who don't know that they're welcome at the table. There's a story about a young pastor, Roger Swanson. He became a pastor. He was a young hoodlum in the day, delinquent in his youth. He and his buddies were getting ready to go to a pool, a billiard tournament, skipping school to go participate in this. So they figure they needed a place to practice. So they jump over the church fence. They pick the lock into the church. They break in. They find their way to the youth room where there's a pool table in the middle of the night. And as they are playing and having a good time, who should walk in but the preacher? And they all know, wondering if he's going to call the police, he's going to call their parents. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. Out of all the people in this neighborhood, you boys are fighting the hardest to get in. He said, here's a key, come and go as you please. And the young man, Roger Swanson, said, that's the day I became a minister, when I knew that I was invited and in a safe place in the church. Inviting people is at the core of who we are. For just functional church, there was a, a church growth organization that put together some stats. Why do people come for the first time to church? 2% because they have a need that they want the church to meet. 3% just kind of wander in off the street, just walk-ins. 6% because the pastor impressed them. That number would certainly be higher here. 13% because of a specific program or programmatic offerings from the church, and 76% because family or friends invited them. 76%. Now, those other things, staff and programs would help retain them, but to get folks in the first time, 76% were invited by family or friends. It is relational evangelism. It's what works the best. Once we realize we have been invited and we claim our spot on the table in this life, who then can we invite? When you think about it that way, it's a, it should be a little less daunting. Who needs to come to this party that's not at the party? It's fun inviting people to parties. Invite them to Christ. This is our call today. As we begin a new church programmatic cycle, the offerings for tonight, the dinner that we will share in the communion after is all in the way of accepting the invitation that's been placed before us and going then out into the world to invite others in the ways that you have been gifted to do so, in our schools, in our places of work, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, everywhere that we should roam. So go and know 
that you are claiming your invitation so you may extend it to others and seek not just to believe, but to follow. Christ has set the table. The party is beginning. So let us go together and celebrate this journey. Hallelujah. Amen.